Flo folklore has it that when asked what was the most powerful force the world ever produced, Albert Einstein answered, compound interest. So we don't know if that's true or not. I haven't been able to ask him personally that question. Uh, but compounding is an unbelievably powerful force, whether you're a government leader, whether you're a company, uh, whether you're a money manager, etc., and does play a huge role in determining the future of the world, future of a country, city, state, organization, and pension fund. And so when we think about compounding, the growth rate of the world's population is an increasing or decreasing, and for a thousand years, the world's population was unchanged. Per capita income, is it increasing or decreasing? And once again, for almost a thousand years, the world's per capita income was unchanged. Today, the challenge for so many of the endowments, pension funds around the world are commitments they have to meet and promises that they have made and their actual assumptions. For large corporations, particularly in the U.S. and Europe, many of them have actual assumptions that is quite difficult. And if you look at the slides, you can see here, even though they've ranched down, most of them are still between 7 and 7.5%. Seven One of the world's largest funds in Norway, their objective was to achieve a 4% rate of return. And in meetings earlier today, we've had with them they've been suggesting that maybe their rate of return objectives should be 3%. The enormous responsibility placed on money managers in the world to take on this effort to generate a rate of return. As we've discussed in other sessions this morning, in Japan today, there's almost $20 trillion in assets by corporations and individuals who've accepted a zero rate of return on their money. The group on the stage is not willing to accept a zero rate of return. In fact, they're highly confident that they can generate substantial rates of return on your money. And I thought it might be best if we started today with Gordon, and you can read his background, who's responsible for $130 billion in British Columbia, 550,000 citizens in British Columbia, and is responsible for meeting their pension funds and driving a rate of return. Gordon, how do you look in the world and how do you feel about this awesome responsibility which you have? Well, I sleep well at night. Um, but, but let me put it in context. So it is mainly pension money that we're managing. And the actuaries tell me that a home run for us is six and a quarter to six and a half percent a year. And we've been able to do that, uh, but just uh, the next 10 years, are gonna, we're going to have to work a lot harder than we have the, the, uh, the last 10 years. Uh, with uh, valuations where they are, low growth uh, environment, um, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, getting, uh, it's going to get much more difficult, which is why I'm very happy to be on this stage with uh, three fellows who are going to assure me uh, that they can help me uh, to achieve that over the long run. Uh, but one of the, the problems we're facing, and that's one of the first opportunities for a fund like ours, because it is a fairly, it's not the largest, it's not as big as Norway or Japan, but still $130 billion is a fairly good-sized balance sheet. But what's more important is it is a pension fund, so these are long-term <coughs> liabilities, which means we have long-term assets, and we are cash flow positive. <coughs> and what that means is an environment like we have today where equity markets and some bond markets are pretty fairly or fully valued, I should say, um, maybe some would argue overvalued, uh, there is the risk that you get, um, that you get a, let's say, an overreaction to some bad news. That's actually good for us because we've got to deploy a couple billion dollars a year. So the saying that I like to have is that bad is good. What that means is if I've got to deploy a few billion dollars a year and the markets are down 20 or 30 percent, <coughs> it's on sale. So we, we, that's, that helps us a lot. Uh, you know, the, the pensioners aren't always happy when they see the negative returns for the year, uh, but it's actually good in the long run because we don't have to sell uh, assets during a financial crisis. We don't need the cash. 
but in, in more general, where are we looking today, Mike, which is, I think, what your question is, is what sort of uh, investments are we making today? And let me divide it into three areas, and the first is growth. So where we're looking for growth, uh, India. India, I've spent uh, quite a bit of time in India uh, in the past while. It's a beautiful demographics, democratic institutions, uh, federal government that's dedicated to reform. Uh, so we've got about a double weight in our public equities in India. Uh, where it's more difficult and where I've been spending my time is on some of the private markets. Uh, infrastructure uh, and real estate. Uh, execution is tough. Integrity is not always there with your partners. And it takes quite a bit of effort to find the right partner. <coughs> I was a little worried about China until the first session this morning when Ronnie told me that China was, uh, we didn't have to worry about China anymore and particularly uh, uh, particularly depending on what part of the economy you're investing in. And there is the whole consumerism uh, and, and that sector of the economy, which has not been over-invested uh, in uh, historically. And that's something that's getting, catching our attention. And finally, I mentioned it when I was here last year, which is Africa. Now, India is an area where it's between now and the next 10 years. I think it's very, very exciting. Africa, and I've spent time with uh, some of your people, Mike, over the last year. Uh, we're continuing to look into it. But that's really a story that starts, it's a very, very small base today, uh, 10, to, uh, 10 to 30 years. Uh, but I think we've got to start doing our work right away. So that's the first area, growth. Second area is distress. Uh, I'll go briefly there, but Brazil uh, is a, what a mess. How, what a mess they've made of that in such a short period of time. But if they hadn't done that, uh, some great assets wouldn't have come available. And we're closing on an infrastructure asset there right now, which we would have never, ever uh, been able to uh, get access to if they hadn't gone through this. Uh, sectorally, uh, energy, uh, the energy debt markets are very interesting. Uh, we'll need partners to help us with that. We don't have the resources in-house, but I think that the returns that these seem to be showing are, are quite, uh, quite interesting. And finally, it's not an asset class, but I want to mention uh, where we're looking for returns or to improve the returns of our, of our clients, our pension funds, and that's in fees. The 2 and 20 used to be, uh, I won't say it was great when returns were 20, 25 percent, uh, but I guess people could accept the 2 and 20 at, uh, at 20 and 25 percent. But when you're getting back from some of your managers between 8 and 12 percent, it's pretty hard to make the case that the 2 percent works. And uh, so that's something, and there are ways for us uh, to get around some of that and to try and bring down the fee structure that we're paying. So, Mike, I think I'll stop there. I've got more Gordon, to say, could you uh, give them a feel of how much uh, of the $130 billion is internal and how much is externally managed, one? And two, I think it would be important, whereas some pension funds or endowment have immediate needs and have negative cash flow, yes. so they're in a payout mode. Give them a feel as you look at your money coming in versus money going out. Uh, so in terms of the, the net cash flow, we've got a couple billion dollars a year still uh, that we're bringing in, which allows us, as I said, during the financial crisis, we're not forced to sell an asset because we need cash to pay off pensions. So we don't have to sell an asset at a time, at any time other than our choosing, which allows us to buy a lot more illiquid assets. So we're basically collecting this uh, illiquidity premium. It's a risk premium for a risk that we're really not taking because we're never in a situation where we where we have to sell. Uh, and I'm sorry, what was, the, what was your first question? Well, how you, Maybe I didn't how like what percent question. of assets are managed in? Okay. So we're low for the, the Canadian funds, uh, the, the big eight Canadian funds, uh, a lot of them are managing 75, 85% of their assets uh, internally. Uh, the fund that I'm running and have been running for the last two years is on the low end of that. We're at about 50% of the money is managed internally, but we're increasing that. And that's one of the ways that we're looking at reducing uh, the fees that we pay. Thank you. So, Larry, uh, Gordon has thrown down the gauntlet on fees here. So one of the topics we'd like to discuss is your operation. The second area I'd like you to touch on, Lawrence, is uh, a person has a good idea, but you can't put too much money to work. So, yes, you found an anomaly in the market, but if I have $100 billion, I can't really invest in that market because the size of that market is too small. And if I invested money, I alone would move the market. And in many ways, the hero who will be with us and runs the Japanese pension fund 
and is the co-chair of our global capital markets, he has not really gone as much for indexing because he'd be an index himself and would never outperform the index. So let's, let's talk about the markets that you focused in, the cost of managing the money the way you do, and the size of money that could be deployed in those markets. Okay, Mike, And great. one, Gordon talked a little bit about distressed. In the case of regulation, it's opened a lot of opportunities for you. Just to be clear, Gordon and I had a side deal he broke not to talk about fees. <laughs> <laughs> we go to I had another deal with Mike on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> so Gallup, Gallup Capital is active in what, what some people have been referring to as the safest emerging market in the world, which is the U.S. middle market. We can go to slide two, please. Uh, and and I, I know it sounds funny, uh, but slide two will show uh, it's a 10 trillion, U.S. middle market, $10 trillion a year of economic horsepower. It's about a third of U.S. GNP. Very large. 200,000 companies, and on a standalone basis, it would be the third largest economy in the world. What we do is we are a non-bank lender to U.S. middle market companies. And we find this market very appealing as an investment because it's big, the companies are growing and resilient, and there are structural tailwinds that really are going to last indefinitely, in our opinion, that benefit investors. So we covered big. Let's talk about the growth element of it. Slide three, please. Gallup Capital and NYU have a joint venture on an index tracking middle market companies, uh, the Gallup Capital Altman Index, and uh, there's a lot of statistical validation and structuring. So we have hard data about the performance of U.S. middle market companies relative to larger companies, relative to GDP. And what the data proves is that over an extended period of time, the growth rate in revenue and the growth rate in profit are just about double what larger companies and the U.S. GDP is able to sustain, about a four or 500 basis point difference shown here in revenues. And this is across a wide, wide range of industries. It excludes energy. We don't do any energy lending. There's no energy data in here. Uh, but this is across healthcare, technology, consumer discretionary, consumer durables, uh, even a, a good number of industrial companies. So there's growth and there's resiliency. Why? Well, middle market companies are smaller and they really have to be solving market needs and doing them well to compete with larger companies. And in the private equity backed sector of the middle market, what you see is actual changes in behavior of how businesses are run. It's not just a purchase of a company with a leveraged financial structure that delivers return on equity. And I'll give a, a few examples of that. Uh, one area we do uh, a lot of work with is franchising businesses. We like them as a lender because they're recurring revenue streams. And we're all familiar with restaurant chains and things of that sort. One company we've been involved in has been expanding inexpensive home care services to the elderly through a franchise model where, in effect, they help create mom-and-pop home health care agencies in small communities, give them the infrastructure, give them the training to operate professionally, deal with the regulatory environment, deal with marketing for non-reimbursable expenses. And this company does very well. It's creating hundreds of mom-and-pop businesses, small businesses, uh, while at the same time growing, creating a lot of value. Uh, we see in middle market companies, sometimes a private equity firm is able to increase profitability dramatically to take out inefficiencies. So business-to-business -business software is a very high margin industry if you get your market share up. There are a number of private equity firms that specialize in buying some of these companies when they have an EBITDA margin of, say, 20%, which sounds great, but they really should be working at 50%. And often, one of the key attributes there is the sales force isn't particularly well managed, which is bad from a number of point of views. It's bad, clearly, because profitability isn't where it should be. But if a sales force is ineffective, many customers aren't receiving this product and being able to improve their own productivity. So the, the dynamism of the U.S. middle market combined with the skill of private equity firms who are willing to make the hard decisions, willing to change management, willing to invest for growth, creates 
a fundamental solid base that for us as a lender allows us to charge a good amount and take very little risk. So we've got size of the market, we've got growth and resiliency in the market. If we go to the next slide, we'll talk about some of the structural advantages that we face. Banks are gone from U.S. middle market lending. We're a non-bank. We have about a $20 billion asset under management, almost exclusively in middle market non-bank lending. That would have been the size of a large regional bank 10 years ago. Uh, and bank lending has declined more than 80%. And it's not going to change. I mean, certainly, federal regulations discourage banks from engaging in leveraged transactions. But there's just a... a natural bias against long-term underwriting of complicated loans that are not based with not supported by tangible assets. If the Federal Reserve waved a magic wand and said Dodd-Frank's gone, no restrictions, there's virtually no bank that has the compensation structures, the training structures to assemble a group of people who are able to solve problems for private equity firms and do it in a way where they lose money very infrequently. And this has been going on long before the existing financial crisis. Uh, it raises lots of issues of bank, about bank profitability. The, the exit from banks is not something we've been complaining about, though. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. So within, what does this mean for returns? And there's all different kinds of lending to private equity-backed companies. I've tried to illustrate here three generalized categories. Middle market, which is illiquid, senior secured debt. Broadly syndicated loans, which structurally are also senior secured debt, also floating rate. But much larger businesses are, are what we call the middle market is about 10 to $100 million per year of EBITDA. Broadly syndicated loan market goes from 150 or $200 million a year and up. And then high-yield bonds, which also are in a, a public liquid market. So looking at net returns, and we're very focused on net returns, so we take fees and fee structures very seriously, and I'll argue with you about that in a minute. Uh, but I'm but I'm these waiting. numbers are net returns. Broadly syndicated loans deliver about 3%. Our lending programs on an unleveraged basis deliver about 6 to 8% net. A lot of the investing we do on behalf of clients has modest leverage, about two to one leverage using very long-term safe structures. That generates about 11 to 13 percent, and we think that amount of leverage is, is highly appropriate. Looking at the difference between- Lawrence, let me just talk for a moment. Yeah. So we're talking two to three times leverage where a normal bank would be leveraged today at eight to ten times. So you're using less leverage than a bank would. And in fact, we're using a lot of leverage than even a broadly syndicated loan CLO would use, which might also be in the range of eight times. Or Correct. About two and I, and I want to reinforce a point you've made, if we could here. And that is the dramatic change that occurs once you've provided capital to growing businesses. And if we step back and think of what I would call the beginning of modern capital markets in 1974, if we could pull up the slide that shows job creation for a moment here, Larry. You can see here one of the points that Lawrence was trying to make, I just want to emphasize, and that is once you provide capital to these small and medium businesses, these are companies that often have good ideas, new things to do, but have not grown as fast because capital had not been provided to them. And you can see here with the opening of modern capital markets, this is U.S. in 1974, once again, reduction of bank lending that once you got capital in the hands of these small and medium companies that Lawrence is specialized in, you can see they created 62 million jobs in a period of, say, 30 years, the latter part of the 20th century. And larger companies, jobs decreased due to competition that increased. So one of the areas you hadn't discussed is when you provided capital, a lot of these companies to become much more competitive in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. It back to you. Absolutely. About 60% of new job creation in the United States in the, since, since the recession has been from uh, small and middle market companies. Large companies have not increased employment at all. Uh, to do this, though, we have to operate as an operating business. We have to take up some of the functions that banks used to perform. We have hundreds of revolving loans. 
Our back office has about 125 loan operations and fund accounting personnel. We've got an IT department of over 20 people. Now, there are different strategies in lending, and you can be a desk buyer and charge 50 basis points and take the loans we don't want or the ones that we're selling a little piece of. And that can be an okay strategy if somebody's a good enough asset picker. Uh, and we, do we don't charge 2 and 20, but we charge a lot more than 50 basis points. When you compare the fees we charge to, for example, what banks spend on overhead as a load on their net interest margin, we spend our management fees are less than one-third. And the benefits of us being an operating business, of, in addition to being an asset manager, actually delivering solutions that otherwise couldn't be delivered to private equity firms so that they can grow these businesses and can expand them, it's expensive, and we charge for it. And I think I completely agree with you that fees matter. Uh, I also think that different strategies, depending on the intensity of operations, deserve different fee levels. And I think also, Lawrence, one of the things you've done is, is you've operated kind of in a senior secured area. So you are lending generally at the top of the capital structure to these companies. That's correct. Almost all the lending we do is floating rate, senior secured, U.S. dollar denominated to U.S. companies. So let me move on. We'll come on back in a few minutes. So a large market, um, trillions of dollars, great opportunity, companies that are creating jobs. And you can imagine when I arrived and focused on Wall Street in 68, there was 500 investment grade companies and millions of not, and everyone was focused on the 500, created an interesting opportunity. And I think, as Lawrence has pointed out, these are also the companies that create jobs. And as you think about these opportunities, not just in the United States, but around the world, to serve as a middle market lender from that standpoint. Larry, let's go to you. Um, Larry and I met <clears throat> 40 years ago. We were both in our teens. And Larry did the seminal work on credit in America. And there was a report by uh, Bradford Hickman, who was the head of the Cleveland Reserve, who looked at every single credit instrument issued from 1900 to 1944 and wrote a series of books titled Long-Term uh, Credit, Long-Term Corporate Bond Experience. And Larry updated that work. Uh, in the latter part, the middle and the latter part of the 20th century when we first met. And Larry, you've chosen an unusual place to invest today. Maybe give us a look back historically at the high yield market and an area that your firm, Arena Capital, is focused in today. Sure. Well, the high yield market has evolved uh, over the years. Uh, there's one person on the stage who uh, is responsible uh, more than anyone for opening up that market and uh, giving companies access to capital, um, sitting two over from me. Uh, and the, uh, so the market evolved from what they called um, you know, fallen angels and funny money issued by conglomerates into original loans for, for companies that might otherwise have gone to insurance companies or might not have been able to borrow at all. Um, back in those days, when you went to try to sell these bonds to uh, people, they would say, uh, we buy equities, we buy investment-grade bonds, but high-yield bonds, just we don't have a box for that. And that, that was a tip-off that there's a lot of value there when most people said they, they weren't able to uh, participate. Of course, over the years, that market has now become institutionalized, and uh, most uh, consultants have... Uh, given their clients uh, the green flag to, to buy this, and there is a box for that. What we found is the, we specialized in, um, in short-duration high yield, and this is a subsector of the overall market. Um, we go to slide 12, please. So the high yield universe is about a 1.6 trillion in bonds and about a trillion in bank loans, and the portion that uh, goes out uh, roughly five years is approximately half of that total. So we've um, what we realized was that 
as the market opened up and consultants were uh, recommending this category to large endowments and pension funds and all, that um, there was a segment that was being ignored because uh, the index is 6.3 years average life. And so that was important to, uh, and still is very important to a lot of people competing against the index. And then there were mutual funds that uh, basically try to maintain their payouts. And so they're buying longer term bonds because the yields are, are higher. So that left the five year and under segment uh, kind of, kind of uh, orphaned. And when you talk to people now and you say, um, would you consider short duration? They say, well, we don't want to use up our high yield box. We don't want to use up our cash box. So we don't really have a box for that. And so in my mind, that means that even now, um, aside from the results we've been able to produce, that this is uh, an under, under managed area. Only a handful of advisors actually do it. And it's also an area that uh, someday there'll be a box for it, but right now it's kind of in between um, with volatility of about 50 to 70 percent of the overall index. It's somewhere in between traditional high yield and, and cash. So that's what we specialized in, and um, we've been able to produce returns of 5 to 7 percent a year with very low volatility. So when you get to be as old as I am, you, you look for the downside <laughs> and not the next cycle, and um, preservation of capital is important. And you could argue today that if you buy a 10-year government bond, you might call that safe. But what is safety when, if your interest rates go up, you lose 10, 20, 30 percent of your principal? doesn't sound too safe to me. From what we do, there is credit risk, but the other side of the coin is that um, two-year credit risk, buying something two or three years out, and our, the average life of our portfolios is under three years, that the credit risk is a lot easier to predict than a 10-year bond. Yet um, the rating agencies, for example, will rate a two-year bond, uh, which is pari passu with a 10-year bond. They give them the same ratings when actually the risk is, is, is less in the shorter bond. And you can see that in the credit default swap market. So uh, we think we provide uh, good preservation of capital uh, on the uh, downside when things are getting tough out there and have delivered you know, pretty good returns. And that's so let me, let me paraphrase a few things you said. So Larry has inferred that he's getting older and therefore he's becoming more conservative. Uh, and so instead of um, changing the sector's portfolio, he shortened the duration of his portfolio, he shortened the risk. And so whereas most of the world today, $30 trillion uh, is getting somewhere between negative and 1%, your firm has been able to generate rates return 5 to 7% operating in the same sector of the market by taking advantage of anomalies. And as Larry pointed out, by picking a segment of the market that doesn't necessarily have a natural buyer. And it was interesting when both Larry and I were focused uh, 30 or 40 years ago in this area, uh, you saw that often someone would be willing to buy a stock uh, but uh, was not willing to buy the bonds, which was senior in the capital structure to the stock. And it, it was very interesting when you look at stock portfolios, you often find the weighted average of the rating of their stock portfolios of the debt would be B or double B. Yet their, their debt investments were more in the double A or triple A area. And I think, Larry, uh, you found a really interesting area to attack. And as Larry pointed out today, on a combined basis of bank debt and debt, you're still talking about a market excess of a trillion dollars on a combined basis, even half of that market. So Lawrence really focused on a market that is trillions of dollars. Larry has pointed out there's a unique opportunity uh, to invest in a market that's maybe a trillion dollars. Both of these are U.S. centric. And one of the things, Larry, I, that you, you mentioned I just want to touch on, this concept of risk. And one of the greatest risks, particularly over a long period of time, has been interest rate risk. There was a book, Long-Term Corporate Bond uh, Experience, by a, one of a, a very famous economists called Sidney Homer in the 1950s, early 60s, who worked for Solomon Brothers. And he wrote 
hundreds of pages on why mathematically U.S. government bonds, two and three quarters, could never trade below 100 cents on the dollar. Well, as they traded at 50 cents on the dollar, obviously that mathematical analysis, um, it was nothing to do with credit. It was to do with the level of interest rates. And I think we dramatically underestimate uh, risk today uh, by interest rate risk that, that people are taking. And shorting duration in your case, Larry, and floating rate assets for the most part in, in your case, Lawrence has hedged that. So let's talk about an area that market Omar, that you operate on, that people naturally think has extreme risk. You've invested in countries and parts of the world that most of the people feel uncomfortable investing in. You've bought the equity, so you've bought the bottom of the capital structure here, yet your results of your firm have been nothing less than fantastic. How do you do it? So we have, over the last <clears throat> 15 years, I guess, grown up in rough neighborhoods, uh, sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, the Pacific Alliance countries, MENA, where we started life, Asia. And our hypothesis, Mike, on emerging markets, and emerging markets with a little bit, maybe a bit of coincidence, ex brick in our case. Um, we think these markets are compelling because, A, two-thirds of growth, global growth is going to come from these markets in the next 20 years. They already today account for some 60% of GDP. They will importantly bring 1.7 billion people into the middle income consumption classes in the next 20 years. And hence they matter. Now, these markets, whether it's Africa, whether it's Latin America, whether it's Asia, they share common fundamentals. Demographics urbanization, a favorable and changing macro environment, ultimately leading to growing consumerism. And they're in different stages of their growth trajectory. Africa, the newest kid on the block, therefore coming from a lower base and quadrupling GDP in the last decade, but similar sort of dynamics. <clears throat> now, Africa, case in point, when you're sort of looking at it on a macro basis, it's not a blanket sort of carpet bombing that you will go invest in 50 countries in Africa? No. I think we look at countries which we think, in our opinion, have turned the corner. Turn the corner in terms of having embarked on a reform agenda. These are not mature democracies by any stretch of the imagination. They might support the mantra of two steps forward, one step back. But overall, the momentum, we believe, is accretive, and then we enter that country and we enter it for the long term. And as somebody said yesterday very eloquently, it's the ingredients that we look at, not necessarily making judgment on the system overall. So Mike, these are not markets devoid of risk. There is tremendous risk in these markets, but we, we believe these are more micro risks than macro risks. Number one, we are playing the long-term game, right? We are private equity money. We're going investing in defensive sectors in these markets. So whether it's a coup in Turkey or in Thailand, and lots of coups in our parts of the world, people don't stop educating themselves. People don't stop treating themselves. People don't stop drinking milk. And in fact, as those income curves are coming up, and from an underpenetrated consumption base, they go from drinking milk to frozen yogurt to fruit yogurt, and they go up that consumption curve. So defensive sectors, consumer-oriented sectors, that's one. Two, the need to be local. We will never invest and have never invested in a country until we have local boots on the ground, not in a cosmetic presence uh, context, but substantial context, to be able to see risk from a local lens. Everything, there are shades of gray. And if you see shades of gray, then you would never get out of bed. So you have to mitigate you have to be able to decipher between, as once when I first came to Asia many years ago, somebody said, between a gangster, a mobster, and a rapist. And who would you ideally do business with, <laughs> right? But, and you have to sort of find that mitigation. You have to find that chemistry. You have to find that alignment. And you have to find that entrepreneur, that family office, who subscribes to the mantra of wanting to own a smaller piece of a bigger pie. And that's who you want to do business with, and that might be two out of ten 
people out of the universe of people you meet. And finally, and succinctly, you pay, you play, you're playing a long-term game. Your patient capital, your growth-oriented capital, you must have a corporate foreign policy in these countries. You must have a broader stakeholder approach. Business is about businesses and holistically about all of the stakeholders that you're servicing. So that is key in these markets. And everything else, currency risk is a big one. Legal systems are weak. You don't rely. You have strong shareholders agreements, but you're never gonna, you never want to end up in court in these markets. You want to make sure that you have that chemistry, that alignment, and that groundwork that you did in partnering with the right people. On the FX side, you can't hedge these currencies because they don't go out that long. You have to be able to factor in 6 7% devaluation per annum into your business plans, and your business plans have to be robust enough to be able to generate that kind of growth, to be able to factor in that kind of devaluation. So that, in a nutshell, Mike, is how we try and do it. So I think if we had a common theme here, we've heard from Lawrence, from Omar, and from Larry, and also from Gordon, it has been to look at markets where either regulation or what people perceive excess risk or where something looks like an area shouldn't go into is often the best area to invest in. And I would stress stepping back in a macro area that I want to go and touch on that if we don't invest, there's more risk. So when you think about investing, by not investing or not making a decision, you're actually making a decision from that standpoint. And there was a book written many years ago by Walter Riston, who didn't know he was taking risk in sovereign debt uh, at Citi at the time. But he wrote this book called Risk and Other Four-Letter Words. And when you step back and think about there's risk in everything, stepping off a curve, et cetera, and it's the understanding of that risk that plays into it. So, Gordon, let's go back to you for a moment. We're going to impeach the president of the country. Which country? Brazil. Okay. okay. <laughs> We're going the, we, we look in the future and we see the largest company in the country has serious problems with incentives they've provided or artificially high prices they've paid for products and services. What makes you go to Brazil recognizing you're reading the headlines in the paper? And what I'm talking about go as the largest pension fund in British Columbia. So you are in a fishbowl. It's partly what Omar said, which is uh, there are still day-to-day -day activities that are going to take place. And all of the risks that you're mentioning, Mike, they're all there, they're all real, but it depends on what price you're paying for the asset. And if this turmoil and if this uh, conflict uh, ends up creating uh, uh, opportunities at prices that basically compensate you uh, for those risks, then that's why we would go there. And as I mentioned, uh, it's exactly uh, the scenario that's come up in Brazil recently, and it's allowed us to uh, get access to an infrastructure asset that we would have never had access to if it had not been for all of this trouble. Would you give us another example of where you've been able to invest in what was perceived as a distress risky area? Uh, sure. The financial crisis was a great one. And again, because as a, as a fund in uh, uh, with, with uh, cash, uh, cash uh, uh, inflows, uh, we don't have to sell and we can take advantage of everyone else or other investors duress who perhaps have uh, not financed their assets quite so well. Uh, we were able to purchase uh, uh, ports in uh, not the current fund that I'm running, but the previous one for the federal government. Uh, we were able to pur purchase ports in Australia uh, uh, Middle Eastern uh, owner of the ports had gotten into trouble back home and uh, the best asset as often happens you have to sell uh, your best asset and they sold off 25% of their ports in Australia and we were able to buy that. Uh, there were a lot of great buildings in Manhattan uh, which the owners had purchased and uh, financed them just prior to the financial crisis. And what happened is the owners uh, were technically bankrupt, and so none of the leasing agents would bring in potential clients. And as clients left, these, uh, the occupancy rates in these buildings would drop. And some of them were 30% vacant. 
And we were uh, able to go and buy these buildings with our partners and our AAA balance sheet, uh, even though um, uh, you know, the buildings were empty, the leasing agents knew that they would be able to get paid if they were bringing their clients in. And so we used our balance sheet uh, to, uh, to buy the building, to lease it up, and then to sell it off again afterwards. So these are just a few examples. But the thing is, when the crisis hits, and I think it was you mentioned it, Lawrence, when the crisis hits, you need to be geared up and you need to be ready to go. Uh, and often you have find yourself uh, walking in the direction that everyone else is running away from. So, Gordon, I think that's a great insight. Could you uh, give us a look at to what you look for in a money manager? How do you make the decision on who to give your money to manage? Just for Lawrence, I'll say fees is obviously a part of it. <laughs> <laughs> we had a deal. <laughs> Mike was paying more. Uh, and um, uh, integrity, uh, we'll spend a lot more time assessing our managers uh, than we do the assets. I think if we can get a great manager, a great partner, uh, the good assets are going to come. A, a good manager, a good partner can take a lousy asset and fix it up. Uh, but, geez, you got the wrong partner, and they can take a great asset and mess it up for you. So we'll spend more time. Uh, as I've said, I've been going to India quite a bit, and it's all about finding partners. We're not even looking at uh, Omar's uh, nodding because he's, he's in a lot of these countries, and he knows that the partners that you find are the most important uh, attachment that you can make. Uh, and transparency. We want total transparency as well on everything that's doing. We will not invest in someone uh, who, who doesn't tell us what they're doing with our money. It is our money. We have a fiduciary responsibility, uh, and we want to know where the money's invested. I'll make an interesting observation. About fees? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, there's a, several managers on this dais who are underpaid. But separately <laughs> from that, <laughs> the criteria you describe equally apply to how we look at doing business with U.S. middle market private equity firms. Sure. Absolutely, there's the underlying company. And we, we happen to have, like certain types of companies, so we turn down a lot of deals. But 75% of the business we do is with private equity firms we've done business with before. And it's those same issues of transparency, alignment of interest, uh, understanding what the strategy is, what, what you're referring to is where the, where the money's going. Uh, and it, it's a probably the only way to have successful long-term partnerships, regardless of the segment that one's looking at. But let me add one uh, that neither of us have mentioned, which is alignment. So there has to be alignment. And what that means is I don't want to see somebody investing deferred fees alongside my real cash. I want them to put real money in, which is often uh, some of the larger brand names. You end up with uh, deferred fees. Uh, if you have some of the smaller funds, these guys have got their money tied up. They're, they're not, it's not only their capital, though, it's their reputations. They've, obviously, they've often left large firms to start their own firm. And what they need to do is to prove to all their old partners and bosses that they're going to be able to succeed. And that, for us, is really important, that alignment. They really need to succeed. I think we've underlined a couple points here that we could generalize. And that's the importance of individuals, whether you're managing money or whether you're managing a company. And over the years, you've had a number of books mm -hmm. written about great companies. And only uh, 10, 15 years later, you find out the companies aren't so great. And they be often confuse a great company with the people that work for it. And therefore, when you think about a company or a money manager, you're really talking about the people working for that organization and their skill set from that standpoint. And whether they're a money manager or whether it's a business you're running. Yeah, and I think, Gordon, you've really underlined a very important point. Great talent can take a very difficult situation, turn it around, and make it great. On the other hand, uh, people that aren't talented can take a great company and destroy it in a period of time from, from then. And so as we look at that, one of the other points I think that you've made, Gordon, I want to underline. And Larry, you obviously lived this in your career. When you look at a rating, and a bonds and a credit is trading at 100 cents on the dollar, and they tell you it's rated triple C. Well, maybe it's a triple C at 100. But if it's trading at 30, it might be a triple A. And they don't adjust the rating relative to where you're buying that asset. And so as the value of that asset uh, is determined 
it might far exceed where you're buying the debt at that time. Lawrence, I'd like you to touch base. This market has been, historically, one of the most attractive markets for banks to invest in. <clears throat> their spreads are wider. Their cost of money is lower. Is it just the regulation that's caused them to withdraw? So you've, you've identified a place that you invest in. It's a multi-trillion dollar market. Uh, with all the liquidity in the world today, why are you able to continue to be able to get these spreads? Well, the, the regulation does keep banks out, but the regulation came largely because banks were bad at it. Uh, it's partly compensation structures, partly alignment of interest. Many, many, almost every lender in middle market lending that's failed has failed because they measure their profitability on an annual basis instead of over the life of the loans or life of the funds. And it is, I don't think, possible. I don't think there's anyone who succeeded at compensating their deal makers and their underwriters based on a notional mark to market at the end of the year of an illiquid loan. If we could go to slide six, please. Uh, Middle market cash flow loans are supposed to be riskier than asset-based loans that are against 80% or 70% of receivables and 50% of finished goods inventory. Uh, middle market cash flow loans are supposed to be riskier than mortgage loans and all different commercial and residential. Our team has, over a very, very long period of time, focused as an inherent part of our strategy on low credit losses first. All of our deal makers are compensated based on the profits that investors earn, not in a quarter or a year, but over the life of the funds. And I can tell you that some people don't want to sign on for that. And that's great. We want them to not sign on to that during the recruiting process, because that's not how we want to operate. And we, we've done a good job. I'm sure there's some good luck in there. I mean, we thoughtfully avoided the energy industry. I never would have predicted energy prices have dropped as much as they did. But to get paid what we get paid with this low of a default rate and the uh, very good recovery rates on the, on the ones that come is something banks in general have never been able to do. And even if the regulations went away, they wouldn't be able to do. So I'd like to generalize for you on two points maybe that, Lawrence, we could follow up on there. One, why does one group do better with the same asset than another group? And Omar, I'm going to go to you and Larry on this. And I was recently in Japan earlier this week and looked at a private equity firm that bought a division from Panasonic, and they tripled the profitability in four years, and Panasonic shocked. How could you do it? Uh, but the motivation and the focus, uh, and the focus on a rate of return has been very important from that standpoint. And one of the challenges to private equity over the past 30 plus years is uh, how can you generate these rate of returns and the people managing the business don't generate these returns? That's one. Two, I think one of the points that Gordon made is an alignment of interest. So if I take you back almost 40 years, private equity firms used to be able to get their percentage of profits on every individual investment. So if they had 20 investments in the fund, their incentive fees were based on the performance of each one rather than the performance on the overall fund. And the, and the industry was relatively small until we started lending money to that business in the latter part of the 1970s, early 80s. But we were looking at it from the creditor standpoint that we were representing in underwriting these. And our conclusion is we wanted the private equity firm to care about all their children, hmm. not just some of their children. And therefore, we would not finance private equity firms unless their performance fees were based on the performance of the overall fund. This way, they would invest more time uh, in those investments that went, were not going well to try to resuscitate them because it would affect their overall performance. And I would stress to the audience that what Gordon has pointed out is really important. You have to make sure that you're aligned both as the investor and a money manager. And where money managers are focused more on their money management fee than performance, you might not be aligned from that standpoint. 
And the second point uh, I want to make to drive home here is one of the best ways to make money is not lose it. And so trying to find a way to reduce those losses in your portfolios. A lot of people make money, lose money, make money, lose money. But quite often you find in the long run, if you can prevent those losses from occurring, uh, you can achieve very favorable rates of return. Everyone is, by sheer probability, going to have some good investments. But it's the key of avoiding those losses. So let's go to yourself, uh, Omar. I think one of the interesting views is let's go to Turkey. I've spoken to the group earlier today about Pakistan and the importance of Pakistan to the world. But we could argue that Turkey is one of the most important countries in the world. It bridges potentially a gap between Europe and Asia. It bridges a gap with the Islamic world. It has a large population. It has a relatively strong military. Uh, this is an area you've chosen to invest in. And how do you maybe take us back 10 or 20 years or when you started up to today, how does what's going on in Turkey as we read headlines reflect on your investment strategies? So you can give us a geopolitical investment view of Turkey. I'd love to. I mean, we as, as a firm are, are great believers in Turkey. And while I have nothing uh, to do with Turkey these days, when we started in Turkey in 2005, I, with another colleague, led that charge. So I very much saw the Erdogan government come out uh, of prison and the World Economic Forum, of which we had uh, a former colleague, giving, them center, giving him center stage in terms of a reception, in terms of how he had been wrong, wrongly arrested. And then the, 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 the fear that the business community had at that time that he and his party were closet Islamists there to simply fulfill their agenda of Islamizing so-called the country. Eight years on, the business community had, had actually changed their opinion because uh, Erdogan and his key lieutenants like Ali Babajan and Abdullah Gul uh, were fierce reformers, and they did so under the guise of ultimate EU accession, which perhaps was never going to happen. But under that guise, they undertook what otherwise was going to be difficult structural reform from a populist uh, uh, perspective. And they did it well, and the business community and the, commu and the international community respected them for it. Erdogan, sometime three, four years ago, I guess human nature, hubris, arrogance, after a great run, a successful run, you lose your way. You start to impose your own views on the populace. You start talking about what type of skirts women should wear, where people should drink and not drink alcohol, and these type of things. And there, uh, especially in the context of the urban centers in Turkey, uh, Turkey has over 12 cities with a million and a half plus people. Of course, uh, Istanbul is a big metropolis with 15 million people. Turkey, they're not a walkover, right? These are, this is a country with $10,000 per capita income. And we started to see those, uh, that, that turmoil come in with the Ghazi Park incidents in 2014. But Erdogan didn't listen. And uh, last year, he did a very sort of gutsy move. He lost the elections in summer and called back elections in three months and won a majority. And then came this coup. And this coup was another golden opportunity. Now, there are lots of conspiracy theorists. Was it really, was it really a coup? Was it sort of self-inflicted? But many of us at least saw it as an opportunity for him to regain some of that moral ground. Because when the coup happened, the Turks, from their founder, Ataturk, are fiercely secular. They don't want the military anywhere near. They want the military in their barracks. And so the actual, the populace came out that night on the streets of Istanbul, and they came to fight for this man and for the government and for democracy. He could have used that as a golden opportunity, in my view, to regain that support, to do the right thing. But what did he do? He's gone and locked up 100,000 people, educationalists, ideologists, and, you know. So I think it's, I personally think, it's the beginning of the end for uh, Erdogan. I actually, I thought that two years ago. It's just uh, uh, headed further in that direction. But again, and as a Muslim, I can also say that there were two countries that we would aspire to as the Muslim world, which is seeing a very low ebb these days. Two countries in the world where 
secular Islam was being practiced. Women were in the workforce. Freedom, religion is between man and God, not a public state affair. Turkey and uh, Malaysia, both sadly at the moment, politically at least, a little bit distraught. So let's, you've given us the geopolitical view. Now let's put your investor hat. What was your firm doing in Turkey, say over the last 10 to 15 years? And how has what occurred adjusting your investment strategies? So my Turkey, like all of the other markets I spoke about, 80 million people, <clears throat> young, average, median age, 27 uh, years old, a lot of urbanization coming in. I mentioned 12 cities, going to be over a million and a half in population, which will account for two-thirds of GDP in that country. Um, where it sits, as you mentioned, between East and West, fantastic export hub, lots of multinationals coming and basing themselves, their manufacturing in Turkey. The reform agenda, labor reform, structural reforms, banking reforms, really gave the Turkish economy a very strong underpinning. We've invested over a billion dollars in Turkey. We've exited over a billion dollars worth of capital in Turkey. Um, and we've invested in, we've bought the fourth largest dairy manufacturer in 2000. We're big believers also, by the way, in, in businesses and their portability within our emerging markets and the growing quantum of south-south trade and capital flow. So in 2007, we bought 50% of a Turkish hospital business called Achi Badam. And this was sort of a top-tier hospital catering to sort of the A seg segment income class. We bought 50% with the founder present. And private equity in our parts of the world is all about partnership. It's not about 100% buyouts. You don't want that founder walking into the sunset. You need that alignment. And it is very much a, you know, you need them, they need you. It's a, it's a, it's a coexistential affair. We bought... We bought um, 50% of that business, seven hospitals. We grew it to 14 hospitals or 15 hospitals. EBITDA from 50 million lira to about 210, 210 million lira. And five years later, we brought it here. And we went to Khazana and Mitsui, who owned the hospitals here in Singapore and in the Pantai hospitals in uh, Malaysia. And we actually merged the two businesses. Today, that business, where we have exited, is called IHH, rebranded at IHH, is the second largest hospital business by market capitalization in the world at about 14, 15 billion dollars is listed on Singapore Stock Exchange in Bursa, Malaysia. And it's really at just at the tip of the iceberg in terms of the emerging markets in which it is today present. And it's got a whole long way to go, which speaks to the growth and the potential of these markets. And the Turks, you know, are very nationalistic people, so they were very proud of where Archie went. And like that, many Turkish businesses are going internationally. We lost money in Turkey, too. And that was in 05, 06, when a little bit of hubris set into a barrage also, and we went away from our defensive mantra, and we thought everything we would touch would turn to gold, and we went into a high-end luxury yacht manufacturer, <laughs> which seems to be a particular pet peeve of most private equity firms, but we lost money over there. <laughs> but otherwise, between dairy, between banks, between hospitals, between education, between student housing, Turkey has been a big market for us. And Hepsi Barada, we have now started to invest in the new age economy because we don't think it's necessarily a technology sideshow. It is pervading mainstream business and is now just another delivery channel. So the Amazon lookalike of Turkey, Mike, uh, about a year and a half ago, we put $150 million into Hepsi Barada. So I think, once again, we're hearing the same thing, partnership. From that standpoint, partnership with owners and particularly maybe far more important in emerging markets and developing markets. Larry, you've been a leader in fundamental analysis. Could you give us a couple anecdotal examples of uh, how you've been able to get incremental rate of return on what are relatively short, less volatile securities? What is the environment that was created that allowed you to do that? Well, I think it starts at the top, and you have to uh, instill a culture in your organization and um, hopefully you've hired smart people that know what they're doing or you're bringing people up from um, you know, medium level to senior and you have to uh, give them some guidance, uh, tell them what, what you think is important based on uh, your experience. And as Mike said, um, how do you avoid making a mistake? Uh, and what we do, one mistake and uh, we're just going for singles and doubles and if you 
if, uh, if you strike out, it can be very expensive, uh, even if you're diversified in terms of your, uh, your overall portfolio. So uh, we're looking for things that don't have a huge amount of risk, um, that may have liquidity, so that if uh, earnings turn south for some reason that wasn't expected, uh, the company can still pay its debts because of unencumbered assets or unused bank lines or uh, you know, things of that nature. So it's, it's a balancing act based on experience and uh, just trying to maintain a discipline. And of course, the portfolio manager has to compare all these different uh, possible investments or very active managers and try to figure out where the best risk reward is. Occasionally, you'll hit a home run, not too often, but um, a few years ago, we realized that Fortescue, the uh, Australian iron ore producer, had some bonds uh, outstanding that had some covenants that they really wanted to um, do it out. So and we made we got very lucky. We made uh, like 20 points on a, on a bond that was trading over par and then was tendered for in the 120s. So, but again, if we're diversified and it's a at most a 2% position, then uh, you know, it was still incremental, four tenths of a percent. But uh, that doesn't happen every day. We're just trying to basically uh, avoid the downside. So I want to just follow up on Larry's point about fundamental analysis. You're actually looking at the covenants. And so in much of the credit business today, people talk about tight spreads. They talk about issues. But it's often the covenants themselves that give you the upside and the protection on the downside. So in closing here, we have one or two uh, minutes, Gordon. What, when you interact with the other large funds in Canada or around the world, what are the important issues that you see as an institution who is responsible for the pensions of hundreds of thousands of people? What are the dialogues? What are the important things that come across between when you get together with other pension fund advisors? Well, if I'm together with the Canadian funds, it's a very different discussion than if we get together, say, with some of the U.S. funds, because the governance system is completely different. Uh, in Canada, we have an incredible amount of independence. It's arm's length from government. Uh, so if I'm meeting with the U.S. funds, often they're complaining about the terrible governance that they're under, uh, and they want to know how they can get closer to being with the Canadian funds. When I'm meeting with the Canadian funds, uh, which are... Uh, you know, they, they're managing 70, 80, 90 percent of the money internally, and that's including private and other things. Uh, it's often uh, we're looking to partner. We often compete against each other. We partner with each other, and uh, we're just looking for opportunities to invest together. Bring the, fee, bring the fees down. <laughs> <laughs> Lawrence, uh, what do you see as the opportunities for yourself in the next couple of years? Uh, we've established an operating business that helps private equity firms change middle market companies in the United States and we've been growing at a fairly steady rate. We want to stay on the investing side doing just what we're doing and the opportunity for us is to grow the size of our business by 50, 70, 80 percent over the next three or four years while maintaining the credit discipline we have and, and we do that by gradually adding a few private equity firms a year to the 110 that we've done multiple deals with, but we, we never want to have a 10% market share. We don't even want to have a 6% market share. So our goal is to not screw up and really you know, stay focused on making loans with covenants, with good partners, and even still, when we realize we've made a mistake, having to have the hard conversations to protect our creditor rights. So, Omar, let me ask you one quick question. Is there a country in the world that we should be looking at as a potential place to invest that your firm is looking at that conventional wisdom would say stay away? Well, I guess, I mean, I, we're in Southeast Asia, but I don't think conventional wisdom for many in the room says stay away. But Indonesia, I think, has tremendous potential. We saw China increasing its GDP tenfold in a decade. I think Indonesia has the potential to do similar. Larry, um, as you try to pass on to, quote, younger chronological managers, what are some of the lessons that 
you think some of the young managers of credit don't really reflect on? Well, we've been around a long time, but there's when you um, when you take financial leverage and you multiply it by operational leverage in the company, then either you can do very well or you can do very poorly. Like uh, you know, lately airlines have done airlines have done very well, but uh, over the years that's not always the case. Uh, retailers kind of have a very hard time. Uh, it's somewhat faddish, and again, there's a lot of both uh, operational leverage, so you have to make sure the financial leverage is low. On the on the fee issue, Mike, I just wanted to say that for institutional money, we're about 50 basis points. So. <laughs> and I think for long, <laughs> we're more. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I really enjoy the opportunity, and hopefully it will be helpful for you in your decisions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.